In most episodes of Justice and the Inner Life, we get to know people who've spent the bulk of their lives in what's considered full-time ministry, mission, nonprofit leadership. Today, we look to a different sector. Early in his career as a young businessman and entrepreneur, Gary Ringer went through a number of experiences that he now describes as being broken by God. These are things no one would choose to go through. But looking back today, it's hard not to conclude that those very difficult experiences and the habits that Gary developed as he responded to them have been truly transformative, not only for Gary's business and work, but also for Gary himself and for countless other lives across America and around the world. Welcome to Justice and the Inner Life, presented by the Christian Alliance for Orphans. We'll explore what it takes to sustain a heart of justice and mercy over a lifetime. Here's your host, Jed Medefit. Well, I am here with Gary Ringer, who is a husband, a father, a grandfather, also the founder of Life Song for Orphans. Gary, welcome to Justice in the Inner Life. Thank you, Jed. It's great to be here. So, Gary, you uh, have, have expressed that you take great joy in bearing the title Orphan Advocate, that in many ways you see that as your primary calling today. But that certainly wasn't always the case for the bulk of your um, career. You've been a businessman. You've been an entrepreneur, started more than 10 businesses, some of which probably crashed and burned, but others that have been quite successful. And uh, so take us take us back a little in time to, to you know, when you first were, were coming out of college and, and decided to enter the business world in the first place. Well, I came out of college, frankly, uh, with no idea what I wanted to do. My dad had a small fee business, and because I could do that and work for dad, that's what I did. And I, in fact, told dad, because I was a musical guy, in fact, told dad, here's what I want to do, dad, for the first six months. I just want to play the piano and and uh, have fun, get better at that, And which, of course, my dad did not like at all. And so he was this shaper of me. I really got to know dad well through the business. And he really mentored me well. And then we started having some success. And by the time I was in my early 30s, I was thinking to myself quite the businessman. And I went to a craft plant, that a craft cheese plant, and I looked through the all the different rooms they had of processing. And I was thinking, wow, I've never seen a feed business anywhere close to this. And so I thought we need to start in a feed business. Uh, excuse me, we need to start in a food business. And so I found a, a lady that was starting a small business and she needed somebody to manufacture for her. And she needed, it was just a sugar product for donuts and she needed somebody to blend that. And we knew how to blend. So we started a contractual arrangement there and we were blending donut sugar. And I was dreaming big. I told Marlo, we're going to get rich and retire at 40, and we're going to live the American dream, babe. And as that progressed, though, as we started that business, immediately we were losing money. And immediately I started realizing how much I didn't know and the the responsibility of making people food instead of pig food, if you will, weighed heavy on me. And so I got into a pattern of night after night, roughly at one o'clock in the morning, I would wake up in a cold sweat and I would lie there thinking all kinds of dark thoughts like, God forbid, we're going to kill somebody. We don't know what we're doing. And then because it happened night after night and I was, uh, became sleep deprived, I would say that period of Jed lasted for roughly five months. Um, and during that time, uh, be, being sleep deprived, I became depressed. And desperation hit. And then that American dream didn't mean anything. So God was breaking me. And I was crying out to him in the middle of the night. And I was wanting to quit. But he didn't give me a piece about quitting. What he put in my heart was to think differently about business. And and ultimately that manifested itself in a written contract. That was just a handwritten contract on a piece of paper that I wrote with an ink pen. 
And it said that, uh, God, if you uh, bless this business, Ringer Foods, and it ever becomes successful, uh, we'll pay ourselves back what we invested in it because Ringer Feeds had paid to get started Ringer Foods. We'll pay that back. Me and Dad were joint owners. Anything over and above that payback with interest we're going to use for ministry purposes. And that contract uh, was life-changing to me. And frankly, Jed, if it wasn't for that contract, life song would have never happened. Mm. So now, honing in on that contract for a moment, this was not, God, if you give me lots and lots of money, I'll give you a little cream puffs off the top. You were actually saying, other than the funds we've invested, returning those to us with interest, this was all going to go to the work of, of the kingdom. That's right. That was the contract. And that gave me, and it wasn't a sacrifice because the business was a fail, failure. It was going nowhere and I was in trouble. It's just what God put on my heart. Mm. And did immediately, as soon as you made that commitment, the business just took off and started raking in funds? Yeah, you know, I used to have a little bit of a paradigm that, you know, if you make it the right motives, God's going to just... Right, bless. right, exactly. Uh, but what actually happened, it was still a journey. But it was really a life changer for me in that... I was still in trouble. I still didn't know what I was doing. But now I had a purpose and I had more of a tangible relationship with God. And so one of the big changes that happened to me that was life changing was my prayer life. And I was fortunate to live out in the woods and we had a hot tub right outside. And so I got into a time of prayer where early in the morning I'd wake up. And I would typically be overwhelmed, not knowing what to do. And I would go out to the hot tub and I would have a prayer time with him. And I would recite the Lord's Prayer. uh, And I would think about, okay, I'm in trouble. What do I do? But the Lord's Prayer, uh, our Father, which art in heaven. And then I would think about who he was. Then I would think about thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I would be submitting whatever you want, Father. And then give us the daily our daily bread. I started praying about the business. And frankly, I had never prayed about business that much before because it seemed like a selfish prayer. And it was a selfish prayer to say, you know, God, make this business do well so I can get rich and retire at 40. Uh, but now this was a tangible partnership. And I always think when I remember that of James, where he says, you don't ask and you don't receive. And even when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask amiss. But now I'm in a tangible relationship and I started experiencing him answer prayers in a way that I never had before. So it was a great journey. And one last thing I'll say on that, before that happened, Jed, prayer was a discipline to me. And it was something I knew I wanted to do and I knew I should do. But it was kind of like a five-minute discipline. And what happened is I became this a half hour to an hour a day sitting out in the hot tub, part of the time just falling asleep, but just relaxed time with my father and it became, instead of a discipline, it became the favorite part of my day and something that I really needed to go on. Uh, so it's, it was a great journey. So, so Gary, it really strikes me that God's primary purpose here was not to create a funding stream for work he wanted to do. I mean, that was a byproduct, but his what he was really after was your heart and, and a changed man. Yeah, you know, I see... In, in me, many times where I've had to be broken to really reach out and understand how much I need him. And, uh, I used to not like being broken and, uh, and I still don't really like it, but, but that is the way God pursues many of us. Uh, maybe some people don't need that as much as I do, but mm. I, I need to be dependent on him and, he takes me through valleys sometime to, to make me that way. And then mm-hmm. that relationship gets rich. Yeah. It, it really does strike me that you look at all the people that God have has used in meaningful ways throughout history, and just about all of them, if you at least dig a little ways into their story, have some time in a serious wilderness. And a lot of times it's it's a literal wilderness, whether it's Moses spending 40 years or David running from Saul and hiding out in caves or uh, Paul's blindness and then followed by his time in Arabia, or even Jesus himself began his ministry with 40 days in the wilderness. Do you, do you feel like for you it was necessary to go through this very, very painful, anxious, 
breaking down time in order to become who, who, who God wanted you to be? Yeah, I really do. I mean, and now when I think of, you know, my goals to get rich and retire at 40, that would have been so less meaningful than what God has taken me through. And um, I don't think I would be here. I, I just know I wouldn't be at Jed if he hadn't broken me through that experience. Hmm. That's compelling, Gary. Just thinking about the fact that what what God was breaking, he was, he was kind of breaking your dishes in a sense, but in retrospect, those, those dishes were just uh, cheap imitations of the real thing in some way. Yeah, that's right. And, and actually, even on the journey to life song, he broke me in a um, second time. And that is after the business became successful and it largely became successful because I'm praying to God about what do I do? And, and definitely we had to make the right decision and God gifts us different ways. But over time, I mean, there were just times where I feel like the special mercy of God was upon uh, Ringer Foods and that helped it become successful. And then after we sold it, Marla and I used that same prayer pattern to say, what do we focus on? And I had a good friend of mine that was a mentor. He told me, don't just give the money away, focus and be involved in something. So we started praying about it and, and we decided to focus on orphans. Marla had years before helped a young couple that we knew that was adopting and we knew how expensive that was. And we had helped that young couple with some finances. And so we had enjoyed watching them raise up this little boy. So that was our heart after we sold that we were going to do that. But we never had a vision for Life Song for Orphans. It was strictly a family foundation. And again, God had to break me. He, through the work that we were doing, helping people adopt, we got invited to go to Ukraine with a lady that had a ministry that she wanted to pass on to somebody. And we went over there and we met a young man that we really connected with. And he's like a son to me now. His name is Dennis Poshalak. And we saw the ability to help what he was doing in Ukraine. But as we got back and started thinking about this, we realized if we get involved in the Dennis Poshalak and the Ukraine ministry, it was going to be a situation where God would have to bring other people to help us. It was way more than we could do by ourselves. And, and neither of us wanted to really ask people to help. We wanted to have this be our little family foundation. And God again broke me. I can remember that, that uh, just through the process of several weeks as we were struggling with what do we do, but one particular point was when I was on a drive to work and Rich Mullins was singing the song, Hold Me Jesus, I'm Shaking Like a Leaf. And that's what I felt. Mm -hmm. And I felt like uh, I was in repentance and that God was saying, you have pride about your uh, small family foundation. And this is not about your family. This is about my family, God's family. And you need to let go and let me work through this in a way that you can't do by yourself. And and so we ultimately did um, let go and let God do that. And now what has happened is my kids, who I was wanting to be involved with in our little family foundation, are way more involved than they ever would have been uh, now that it's life song. And we have met so many people in the body of Christ. I wouldn't know you as an example. Uh, we have just uh, learned how much bigger God is than we had him before in our little box. Mm. Powerful, Gary. And, and this, uh, what you're describing, this kind of series of progressive breakings where you have what you think is a good vision, you think it's sufficient, you think it's going to make you happy and be a fulfillment, and then that's smashed, and yet God replaces it with something much bigger. But then he does that all over again, and, and again, multiple times. What, what a journey. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what's 
I've learned to love it when I have, I'm kind of an idea person. I can drive people nuts with too many ideas, but I've learned to love it when I come up with an idea and then God takes it a different way. Mm. Um, and that makes me know that it's God and it's not me. And just from my side of the equation, I love looking uh, for, somewhat from a distance, somewhat up close, but and seeing the fruit of that, both in the U.S. with Lifesong, working with churches all over the U.S. to help them to start and uh, and grow adoption support funds within those churches, but then working all over the world with uh, really with the local church in Zambia and Ukraine and and many other places to help the local church be the answer for for the kids in those places uh, and, and and just thinking what how much grander that vision is than what you could have ever dreamed up on your own when you were just starting out. Yeah, that's right. And one thing that is just happening right now, Jed, that I'm excited about, and it, again, I'm a, a creative guy. That's the way God had made me. But, you know, God's the creator, and he is so much more creative, uh, obviously. And one thing that has happened, even going back to our business roots, in Ukraine and in Zambia about seven years ago, we were through a donor, somebody, somebody again that we met because of Lysong versus our family foundation. They wanted us to start growing uh, strawberries as a way to put our kids to work, if you will. And so we started that in both countries, and it struggled over time in Zambia, but our Ukraine team really got good at it, and they started using hydroponics. They really started focusing on that. And what happened is now in the last year and a half is I have Ukraine kids, our Ukraine kids that came up in that system are down in Zambia helping our Zambia kids uh, uh, do hydroponic strawberries. And, and Lord willing, we're going to be starting in Uganda. And, you know, who would ever thought, I would have never thought, we're going to have our Ukraine kids be missionaries to Zambia. I love that. I love that. You know, and, and I, so I've I've had the privilege of being at your uh, work there in in Ukraine and, and loved it. And and I, you know, it was so clearly transformative for everyone involved. I mean, the the the, the kids who are working there are learning skills. They're learning hard work. They're learning uh, agriculture. They're learning marketing uh, of of the of the products and how to make them premium products. Um, but but I also noticed there was also an impact happening in the lives of American business people. That life song has brought into that journey in different ways, whether whether through that work in Ukraine or otherwise as well. T talk a little bit about how it, it just it, it really strikes me, at least that that you be, I think because of the unique journey you've been on, have a desire to help business people be involved not solely on a writing a check basis, but but with their unique gifts and skills. Yeah, it goes back to what I've already mentioned, and that was a good friend and mentor of mine when after we sold the company and I said to him, Clay, what do we do with this money? And he basically said, be focused and involved. And so I, I kind of a burning desire of mine, a passion, if you will, is to get people involved. In fact, our lifelong prayer, if you will, is, you know, that Jesus, you said the fields are white with harvest and that we should pray to the Lord of harvest for more laborers. And certainly the orphan field is white with harvest. You know that better than I do, how many perishing kids they are. And think of the opportunity there is for those kids if they're uh, trained and nurtured properly. Uh, but we need laborers in this field. So what I know about business people is they're doers. They want to get involved in something, but they... Uh, they want to be a difference maker. So, so what we have done is we've tried to get, we, we're involved in numerous projects. Now we try to get a group of businessmen together, businessmen and women to be involved and with boards that are not overly big, uh, so that they feel like they can have an impact. Number one. And then our goal is to get more and more sustainable business projects going. And, and it is hard to do that in these third world countries. But that's our goal is to get people involved and, and, and get our kids having a bright future. Mm. So, so meaningful. You know, I, I think of, uh, there's a, a, 
an individual who, who financially supports a lot of good work, but one thing he sometimes feels, he, he's described that often people who are leading nonprofits will come to him and essentially their message without saying it is, you know, with your money and my brains, we can do something great. And they're just looking to him as a source of funds. And well, the truth about this guy is he actually many years ago discovered in, he was working in the financial industry and discovered a flaw in a Nobel Prize winning formula that he figured out and no one else in the world had figured out and was able to exploit that flaw to, to, to much gain over time and and has done immense good with the funds he has raised through that. But if you think a guy like that doesn't have immense good and perspective and insight to bring to um, a kingdom undertaking. We're, we're mil- really missing out. Yeah. And, you know, uh, again, with that thought in mind, I believe there are so many projects out there that could be done, but there's no workers. And, and, and at the same time, we may know things and we may know how to do things at Lifesong based on our uh, now 17 years since we sold that business. I can't hardly believe it. How time is flying. But based on all that history and connections like you and other people that we have, we know of projects that need people like that. Mm. And so I hope that we can be a connector. And and one of our main game plans at Lifesong is to be a, a back office for ministry so that their people can focus on the actual ministry instead of things like that are somewhat tedious, like accounting and certain things and marketing and just how to set things up that we've been through. And so we're really trying to help other people get into the fields white with harvest. Mm, so good. You know, thinking back to the early parts of your story and, and just even what we're talking about here, uh, it, it strikes me that, you know, God's biggest interest is in the transformation of human lives. And often, though, when, when we're in ministry, we, we think about, for instance, serving orphans and that God's interested in transforming the lives of orphans, which he certainly is. But obviously, he wanted to change your life in this process. And then he wanted to change Dennis's life there in Ukraine. And he wanted to change the business people that are involved with you. Um, and that that the, the whole vision of ministry is a changed life. I think it was actually Peter Drucker who said that the purpose of the nonprofit is a changed human life altogether. And of course, Drucker wasn't just uh, the founder of management science. He, he was a committed follower of Christ. And I think he understood that's God's ultimate kingdom purpose is the changed human life altogether. And so when a ministry like Lifesong is inviting in business people to be a part of that in a way that's more than just giving, it ultimately makes a, a transformative difference in their life journey as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've read some of Peter Drucker and I've, I've learned from him but I think even of our own life, uh, Jed, our life is so much fuller because of God walking with us. And and I, I think in this, I'm partial, I'm focused on orphans. But I think of our, our family. And our family is closer because of this journey. And I have... 15 grandkids and nine of them were adopted. Marla and I never adopted and yet we started this, um, adoption ministry and, but our kids have adopted. And so when I think of our life without the lifelong journey, it would be so much lacking joy and purpose that we have right now. And joy and bringing joy and purpose is our mission statement with lifelong. And it happens hopefully to the kids, but to the people. Who are involved? And dig into that a little further, Gary. How, how did this uh, impact? Let's talk about your kids. And, and um, you know, they're if you had retired and gone to a golf course when you're 40, my guess is they're one of their biggest interests in life would be being great golfers too, right? That and not that there's anything wrong with golf necessarily, but they would they would be focused there. But it but it seems to me like what became a passion for you and Marla has now shaped your kids' sense of priorities and, and and really their whole lives. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I'll start with Marla. After we became empty nesters, Marla was kind of wondering, okay, what do I do? And I think a lot of wives uh, maybe at that stage in life struggle with that. Well, then, it, first of all, we started having grandkids. Uh, but second of all, she got involved in life song. I personally, starting with me, uh, 
when, at this age, I can't believe it, but I'm 65, but I talk to people, I just talked to a, a friend recently and he's saying he's getting bored in retirement. And I think, wow, there's so much potential there that they're missing. And then going to the kids to answer your question, um, yeah, with our grandkids and them being adopted, and I even see my grandkids, there have, several of them have been, you know, overseas to our projects and they're talking about things about being a missionary when they grow up. My grandkids, I never had any thought of that when I was their age. So, um, you know, the Bible says I have no greater uh, joy than see that my children walk in truth. And so I'm just thankful for the way he broke me. I'm sure there'll be issues and problems with our family. But I really see the fruit of this going to them in ways that I could have never done on my own. Mm. And it, it is beautiful, Gary, from the outside. I know you you give God all the glory. Um, and it is glorifying to God, but it is also beautiful for for uh, fellow believers and, and others just to look in and see a family um, like yours where, where, you know, Megan and Corey have adopted a number of kids, uh, some of them with special needs. And yet uh, you, you go into their home or you have them over as we did the other night. And there's just so much joy and laughter and sweetness. And and then Jamie and Clint are, are focused on foster care and advocating for kids in foster care and, and inviting others into that. And, and then Leslie, I know, taught in Zambia at the Life Song School and then I believe she actually had two of the young people that she'd met over there come and live with her while they attended university in the U.S. Is that right? That is correct, and that's Linus and Winnie. And uh, so I have a confession to make here. I said we have nine adopted grandchildren, and Linus and Winnie are not actually adopted. They're here on student visas. They call uh, Leslie Auntie Leslie, and they call Marlon me Grandpa and Grandma. So I'm counting them as adopted, even though they're <laughs> not officially adopted. That's yeah, good. it's pretty cool with Leslie uh, bringing them back, and it's been really made a, our life richer. So, Gary, if you could talk to you know twenty five year old Gary, and you were giving him counsel and encouraging him in this, per- perhaps at an age where you hadn't yet caught a vision for something larger than just making a lot of money and retiring at forty, what what word of encouragement and counsel would you give give him? Well, to me, the game changer, yes, God broke me several times, but the game changer was this quiet time uh, on a daily basis. And I love the idea. In my case, it's hot. It's a hot tub. My hot tub just broke down yesterday. It was leaking. So right after this call, I'm going to call the people and say, you got to come out and fix my hot tub. Uh, but I love having a quiet spot to to just spend time with the Lord on a daily basis. And then if you're praying to him on a daily basis and you develop that relationship, God's going to lead you where you're supposed to go. And it may not be, uh, obviously, for everybody or for ministry, but he has a place. And so that would be my main key is for people to develop that relationship. And I think part of that is just getting involved in something and then I, I don't know. I like to and sometimes be a little bit over my head where I know I don't know what to do. And then I'm basically pleading to God for mercy and, and asking him to show the way. And sometimes that brokenness is not fun, but uh, that is when you reach out to him. One of the scriptures that I've appreciated through the years is the, it, and I can't even say it exactly, it's in the Psalms, but it's basically saying that he gives his mercy to us according as we hope in him. Thy mercy be upon us according as I hope unto thee. So there's something powerful about just saying, God, I need your mercy. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm hoping in you. I'm hoping that you'll show me through. And and then he sh- he shows up. Hmm. Gary, one thing I, I really appreciate about Life Song is I, I see that uh, you and Andy and the, the the leadership there have really sought to prioritize habits and practices within the team that nurture the the soul health of the team. And I, you know, I, I think it's so easy when you are working in orphan uh, service and advocacy or, or or related fields to just focus on the work. There's so much that needs to be done, and so we can literally work ourselves to exhaustion uh, simply. 
uh, going after the mission. And of course, that's that's often important, important uh, labor, of course. But I see people go running dry in that as well. And that's one of the reasons we have this podcast. What, what has motivated and kind of guided your desire to, to take what we're talking about here and not just uh, live it out personally within your family, but to really embed it in the DNA of Life Song? Well, personally for myself, if I am overworked, I be, I get overwhelmed. I mean, maybe goes back to the depression I had, but I need a certain amount of margin. And then I love life. If I have time to do my quiet time in the morning and have, you know, some space, I'm much more productive and, and I love life and happy people do better work. Now I have to say with what we've done here at Life Song, that has been more my team putting that together. I've been fully supportive of it. But as an example, one of the things we do is a weekly prayer where, uh, where we get everybody together. And it's always a rich time and, uh, of just praying around the table and uh, hearing prayer requests from some of our teams. But frankly, I was it was my idea to get that prayer meeting started on, our, on a routine schedule, but I'm not a very disciplined guy. So what happened, it just didn't happen until I had Rich, who I think you know, we said, Rich, you make sure this happens on a weekly basis. And and Rich has really been the champion of getting this whole quiet time and, and, and helping our people as far as quiet time at work. Come in, have some prayer time. Don't just go right into work. You know, and it's different for everybody, but we really want to encourage them to have time because we know where the strength comes from. And and our weekly prayer meeting that he makes sure happens every Wednesday has really been a, a sweet blessing. What would you say to a, a businessman who is heading towards likely retirement and yet, you know, maybe is going to be 60 years old and, and very possibly has several decades ahead of potentially fruitful service? What, what counsel would you give to him or her? Yeah, I think there are some really great opportunities to use business as ministry. There are tools that the National Christian Foundation has um, worked on through the years on how to hold businesses within foundation. And National Christian Foundation, I would recommend people reaching out to them. And an offshoot of that is another one called Impact Foundation. Both of those groups help businessmen form businesses or hold businesses within foundations. And I am seeing this here at Lysol and National Christian Foundation on a much bigger perspective is seeing this where that I believe God is moving. He's moving in the younger folks that the millennials, they want to be a part of something that has more purpose. And, and I see it in my age who want to give to something that is perpetuating instead of giving to something that you have to keep giving to is to create, if you will, call giving engines. So my feeling is there is an area of using business as ministry that is really a movement that God is creating. And going back to Blackaby years ago, I think you probably remember Henry Blackaby. If you want to experience God, look where he's moving. My personal opinion is he is really moving in this business arena to use Christian businessmen that really focus on their business, not being a money maker for them, but to be a money maker for the kingdom. And I would just throw out one other idea that, that I've been taught by National Christian Foundation. And that is for many Christian businessmen, they have more than what they need. Uh, and so the, the, tw- the idea that they gave to me was have a personal finish line. Okay. You think through with your wife and your family, what is, do you need? And then if you, if God blesses you with business skills, then once you reach that finish line, then use your business skills to create more money that you just give away. And, and that puts you into more of a tangible partnership with God. And I would be welcome anybody on you that listens to this. If they want to talk to me about that, I'd, I'd love to talk to them about it. I believe in that 
it wasn't my idea, but there's so much power in business and so much purpose that can be done for God's kingdom and for yourself. So good. Well, Gary, I I just really appreciate what you shared and in and, and your example, not not just through Life Song, but personally as well as, as a guy who's you know, just a couple decades behind you. And um, I, I look at the things you've had in your journey. And of course, some of those things being broken, no one wants to be uh, going through, you know, anxiety and depression and, and things seeming to go down the tubes with business. All of those things are things none of us want. But the fact that you leaned into those and received the good gifts God has and had for you in those and, and the fruit that then he has grown uh, in your life through that, I think, you know, when I'm in my mid 60s, I not only want my family to look like that, my kids to have that deep sense of purpose and be living for the Lord, a marriage uh, where I delight in being with my wife, as, I, as I've seen you and Marla uh, do, and, uh, and, and just the, the, the sense of that deep, rich and purpose that uh, the, the world just uh, that doesn't provide anywhere else. Yeah, well, thanks, Jed. And, and I tell Marla, I, you know, if, if uh, God would take us home today, life has been much more than we ever dreamed it. Amen. Amen. Great word to end on there, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. And God bless you and what you're doing and and the journey you have ahead of you. Disappointment, depression, desperation, other things that Gary experienced early in his career and at other times along the way as well. These are certainly things that God can use to draw us near to his heart. But often it's not just the experiences themselves that are transformative, but how we choose to respond to them. And perhaps especially the habits that we develop along the way. I think especially of Gary's growth in his commitment to prayer. From tossing up a handful of words from time to time to earnestly, fervently seeking God in prayer for 30 minutes or more a day in dependence and even desperation. So whether you're in a place of life where you're going through some of those very painful things or just desire to lean towards God, consider habits or perhaps one habit that you can increasingly live into that will grow you in dependence and even desperation towards our Heavenly Father. If you enjoyed this conversation with Gary and would like to get to know him better, I would recommend the book Radical Business from Ownership to Stewardship, which Gary recently wrote, shares many of the stories that we touched on at greater depth. And if you would like to connect with him, as he generously offered to do, we'll have information in the show notes as to how you can do that. You've been listening to Justice and the Inner Life with Jed Medefit, a production of the Christian Alliance for Orphans. To learn more about the Alliance, visit kfo.org.